Lieutenant Colonel Sheldon A. Goldberg enlisted in the U.S. Coast Guard Reserve in 1955 before transferring to the U.S. Air Force, we he, um, where he was assigned to serve as a clarinist in bands in Nebraska and the Republic of Germany, accepted to Air Force officer candidate school following graduation, Colonel Goldberg was awarded Navigator Wings in January 1962. Over the next 18 years, he flew the C-124 Globemaster, the all-jet C-141 Starlifter, and the two-seat F-4 Phantom Fighter. As an F-4 pilot based in Thailand, he flew 27 missions for the only night dedicated fighter squadron, participated with the Navy abroad, the USS Coral Sea, and the Gulf of Tonkin, which included flying off the carrier on a night mission to Haiphong, and was on one of the lead aircraft on the first authorized mission against North Vietnam in 1970. Upon completion of his combat tour, tour, Colonel Goldberg had flown 254 combat missions, of which 187 had been an, at night and three over North Vietnam. For his actions in the war in Southeast Asia, Colonel Goldberg was twice awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross with V device for Valor and 17 Air Medals. From 1970 to 1981, Colonel Goldberg took on greater responsibilities in overseas postings in Southeast Asia, the United Kingdom, West Germany, and the Netherlands. In 1981, he returned to the United States and was assigned to Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama, where he served as Chief National Security Affairs Division, Air Command, and Staff College then as Chief Department of Curriculum Development, School of Associate Programs, Air War College until his retirement on August 1st, 1985. Following his retirement, Colonel Goldberg worked as an independent consultant for the Institute of Defense Analysis and then served a 16 year career in the CIA. Since retiring in 2002, he has remained active in the leadership of several veteran services organizations and serves as, a, as the Dawson historian at the National Museum of American Jewish Military History in Washington, D.C. Colonel Goldberg holds a BA in political science from the University of Puget Sound and a master's in Soviet and Eastern European studies from the University of Wisconsin in Madison and a PhD and modern European history from the University of Maryland. Among his many awards, he holds the Career Service Medal from the CIA and has been awarded the Military Order of the World's War's highest award, the Gold Patrick Henry Award for Patriotic Service. I could not decrease his bio because I believe it deserved all the accolades and for us to learn more about him. I'm so excited for you. Without further ado, this, the podium is yours. I got to get official now, if you'll excuse me, just the one <laughs> head on. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, uh, I want to thank you for the honor of inviting me here today, this afternoon. As uh, Marilyn said, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Sheldon Goldberg. I spent 30 years in the Air Force, and I am now the docent and historian at the National Museum of American Jewish Military History in Washington, D.C. Not too long ago, a theatrical group called the Abbreviated Shakespeare History Company, some of you may have seen them, played in Washington for quite a while. Uh, their forte was a whirlwind tour of the history of the world in 90 minutes, hence the name. Unfortunately, I don't have 90 minutes. So I'd like to give you my interpretation of an abbreviated history of Jews in the military, a history that began 350 years ago. 
The history of Jews under arms begins in pre-colonial times when the, in 1654, Asur Levy was part of a group of Jews from Recife, Brazil, who settled in New Amsterdam. They left Brazil to avoid the inquisition that had been brought there by the new Portuguese rulers and uh, that nation only to come under the rule of the anti-Semitic governor of New Amsterdam, Peter Stuyvesant. Now in those days, armed burghers were required to man the walls of the city, but Stuyvesant refused to allow the new Jewish community to participate nor bear arms, but they had to pay a tax to pay for the burghers that did. Asser Levy was a very litigious man. He was also a matchmaker. He was the ritual butcher, you name it, he was it. Uh, he then petitioned the Dutch West India Company to allow the Jews to bear arms and participate in the defense of the city, which was finally granted in 1656. And it's from this pre-colonial time that we date the beginning of Jewish military history or Jewish military contribution to the defense of this nation. We can only assume that Jews participated in pre-revolutionary wars, such as the French and Indian War. I have no direct knowledge of that, but in 1895, Simon, Simon, Simon Wolf wrote a book called The American Jew, a Soldier, Patriot, and Citizen, in which he attempted to name every Jew that served in the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, and specifically the Civil War. Now in the Revolutionary War, Many names that Wolf listed in that book were not Jews, but simply Jewish sounding names. Uh, that said, we have 47 names from the Revolutionary War that show the levels to which some Jews served. Other sources say as many as 100 did. Uh, the population at that time in the United States was 6, 2,600. Joseph Bloomfield served in 1776 to 1815 and rose from captain to brigadier general. I consider him one of the first career officers. Aaron Benjamin from 1777 to 1815 rose from ensign to lieutenant colonel. Isaac Franks was a colonel and an aide to General Washington. Jacob de la Motte, Jacob Leon, and Benjamin Moses served as, on General Pulaski's staff and Benjamin Nonis, a major on General Lafayette's staff. When the war in 1812 began, the name that stands out is that of Commodore Uriah P. Levy. Levy started his 49 naval career as a cabin boy in 1806, served as a supernumerary sailing master during the War of 1812, capturing 20 British ships until he was captured and taken prisoner by the British until the end of the war. Levy then rose through the ranks until sometime after 1855, he was put in charge of a, the Mediterranean squadron and promoted to Commodore, the highest rank in the Navy at that time. But he faced considerable anti-Semitism throughout his career, to which he, he reacted, resulting in six court martials, one for killing a man in a duel who insulted his Jewishness. He was desist, dismissed from the Navy twice, but both times he was reinstated. Levy is also noted for a couple of things that people do not know too much about. The first thing he did was he ended corporal punishment in the Navy, which the sailors really, really liked. But then again, he also ended the rum ration, which they didn't care for so much. But very few people also know that he was the one that restored Monticello and he commissioned the statue of Thomas Jefferson that now stands in the Jefferson Memorial. Lastly, Levy's name was given to the Jewish chapel built at the Naval Academy in Annapolis in Maryland, and is only one of two federal buildings on which one can see the Star of David from the outside. The Civil War saw Jews from both sides participating. Approximately six to 8,000 fought for the Union, including six who became generals, while two to 3,000 fought for the Confederacy. Now the year 1862 was a pivotal year for Jews in several ways. The first was a change in the law 
that allowed only ordained Christian ministers to serve and become chaplains. As a result of the change, three Jewish rabbis were chosen. Rabbi Joseph Frankel, Rabbi Henry Guttelf were appointed hospital chaplains, while Rabbi Ferdinand Leopold Sarner was elected a regimental chaplain. Sarner saw service at the Battle of Gettysburg, where he was allegedly wounded. Uh, the gentleman on the top, uh, Rabbi Arnold Fischer, was the one who went to President Lincoln to talk about getting the law changed, but it had already been changed when he got there. Confederate rabbis also served their troops, but not as military chaplains. Uh, we should also note that <clears throat> Judah Benjamin, a noted jurist, also served the Confederacy as Secretary of War and Secretary of State. He escaped to England after the war, where his Jewish jurisprudence is still recognized today. Uh, the key event, the second key event that took place in 1862 was the introduction of the Medal of Honor, the first U.S. medal to be awarded in combat in which five Jewish soldiers were recipients. In fact, up until just a couple of weeks ago or months ago, we only knew of four. The Chappelle Manuscript uh, Institute has been doing research on how many Jews actually served in the uh, Civil War, and they came up with a fifth one, a gentleman by the name of Jacobson, but we do not have his photo yet. In the years following the Civil War, and especially the last decades of the 19th century, there was a wave of anti-Semitism that spread across the United States. Anti-Semitic articles appeared in journals and magazines, some written by former Union soldiers, who, one who wrote that in the four years he served in the army, he never saw a Jew in uniform. To counter those rumors, 63 Civil War veterans gathered at the Lexington Opera House in New York City on March 15, 1896, and formed the Hebrew Union Veterans Association, the forerunner of what is now the oldest active American veterans organization in the United States, the Jewish War Veterans of the United States. Nonetheless, three years later, in 1898, Mark Twain wrote in Harper's Monthly that the Jew is a frequent and faithful and capable officer in the civil service but he is charged with an unpatriotic disinclination to stand by the flag as a soldier, like the Christian Quaker. In 1898, Jews were stormed with Teddy Roosevelt, storming San Juan Hill in the Spanish-American War. And six years later, in 1904, Twain retracted his first article in Harper's and wrote, Postscript, the Jew as soldier. When I published the above article in Harper's Monthly, I was ignorant, like the rest of the Christian world, of the fact that the Jew had a record as a soldier. I have seen, since seen the official statistics, and I find that he further furnished soldiers and high officers to the Revolution, the War of 1812, and the Mexican War. In the Civil War, he was represented in the armies and navies of both the North and the South by 10% of his numerical strength, the same percentage that was furnished by the Christian population of the two sections. This large fact means more than it seems to mean, for it means that the Jews' patriotism was not merely level with the Christians, but overpassed it. On April 6, 1917, the United States entered World War I. When it was over, approximately 250,000 Jewish Americans had served in uniform. Almost 6% of the total U.S. armed forces and just over 5% of the total Jewish population. Of whom 3,500 were killed, 12,000 wounded, and over 1,000 decorated for heroism. The U.S. Army was only 128,000 strong in 1917 and ranked 17th in the world. To enlarge it to the several millions that would be needed, a draft was introduced called the Selective Service Act. The success of this Selective Service System was such that 42,000 Jews volunteered even before the draft began. No, no. 
that got out of order. This is the 63 Civil War soldiers that formed the Jewish war veterans. Initially viewed with apprehension, Jewish recruits proved themselves to be good and patriotic soldiers. They made up 25% of the 77th Liberty Division that was formed as a totally conscript division. Because of its high immigrant and varied ethnic makeup, 70 languages were spoken by the recruits. The 77th was nicknamed the Melting Pot Division. Later in the war, the 77th was the only division to reach the Yane River, penetrating farther into German held territory than any other American uh, division. The Jewish soldiers of the 77th were called by their officers, the best soldiers on earth. Also in 1917, Congress authorized the appointment of chaplains at large of faiths not now represented in the body of chaplains of the army. 23 days after the declaration of war, 22 Jewish organizations joined together to form what is now known as the National Jewish Welfare Board. One of the JWB's key acts was to endorse Jewish rabbis to serve as military chaplains, a practice they continue to do today. 40% of the English speaking rabbis in the United States applied, 34 were endorsed and 26 received commissions. This was the first time that rabbis served in uniform as uniformed military officers. 12 of the newly commissioned chaplains served overseas. One of the 26 rabbis, David Goldberg, became the first rabbi to serve in the Navy and was responsible for having the tablets of the law and the Star of David approved as the Jewish chaplain's insignia, which is still worn on the uniform today. Among the many Jewish heroes who served in World War I were four Medal of Honor recipients, Sergeant Sidney Gumpertz, Sergeant Benjamin Kaufman, Sergeant William Sowelson, and Sergeant William Shemin, who received the Medal of Honor posthumously in 2015, 97 years after his heroic actions. I had the good fortune to be at the unveiling of his marker in Long Island, New York, when that was done. It's a long, interesting story. Uh, he had done some remarkable things. He ran out into no man's land under heavy machine gun and rifle fire three separate times to bring back wounded soldiers. Uh, he was later shot himself, shot in the head. Uh, he lost hearing in the left ear. His officers were killed, and he led the platoon back to safety. Now, for that, he got the Distinguished Service Cross, which is the second highest award. Um, his friends later on, years later, decided that he deserved more. Uh, he was a rat pack, so he kept all his papers, which was really, really good. Uh, and then back in about uh, 2013, uh, it came to the Jewish war veterans, uh, and we went together and helped with a uh, congressman from Missouri where the family lived, and they wrote up in the uh, Defense Appropriations Act the William Shemin. Jewish War Veterans uh, Bill. Uh, bill went forward, but it stopped because it didn't have a second sponsor. So they had to wait another year. They got a second sponsor. It went forward. It was stopped at the army level because there were no eyewitnesses. And you have to have submit a request for a medal like that within five years of it happening. And Colonel Burtnick, who was the department uh, commander here in Maryland, an administrative officer, retired colonel, uh, told the army, you don't need eyewitnesses. All you need to do is check the statements and prove, have proof that the men who made the statements at the time were there, which they did. So it went up another level and it got stopped again because somebody had taken that five-year waiver out of the papers. So it had to go back around again, put the waiver back in, it moved all the way up the chain, got to the desk of the Secretary of Defense, and he got fired. So they had to wait for a new Secretary of Defense to come in. He finally came in and he approved it. And finally, in 2015, 97 years later, his family received uh, the Medal of Honor from uh, President Obama. And it was on TV. You might have seen it in the news. 
uh, the finest tribute paid to the Jewish fighting men in World War I was given by General John J. Pershing, who said, and I quote, when the time came to serve their country under arms, no class of people served with more patriotism or with higher motives than the young Jews who volunteered or were drafted and went overseas with our other young Americans to fight the enemy, unquote. World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan. World War II saw over 550,000 Jews in the services, as well as 311 rabbis in uniform as officers. While anti-Semitism existed in the services, the war completed a transition that began during World War I, namely changing the perspective of those Jews who entered the service as Jewish Americans and they came out as American Jews. World War II saw three Jews awarded the Medal of Honor for heroism, Captain Ben Salomon, Sergeant Isidore Yachtman, and Second Lieutenant Raymond Zussman. At some point after World War II, the military stopped keeping count of servicemen by religion, and so we have no count of the number of Jews that served in Korea and afterward. Nevertheless, two Korean War the Korean War also brought to light the heroism of two Jewish soldiers, but only long after the war ended. The first, Corporal Tibor Rubin, a Holocaust survivor from Hungary, finally received his Medal of Honor in 2005. Rubin is to me the epitome of an example of anti-Semitism in the military. Uh, like I said, he was a Holocaust survivor. He was in the camps when he was a young man and he swore if he ever got liberated, he was gonna to come to the United States and become a GI Joe, just like those that freed him. And in fact, he was able to. Came to the United States, he was turned down the first time because he didn't speak English good enough. So he steadied and the second time he did pass, he was enlisted, wound up in a platoon that had perhaps the most anti-Semitic first sergeant the army ever had. And when ever, there was a dirty job to be done. This first sergeant would say, get me that son of a bitch to Reuben. And they would get Reuben, Reuben would do the job, come back, and this happened over and over again. The platoon was then retreating and Reuben was then told to go take some guns, some ammunition, and be point guard in the back. We'll be back for you in 24 hours. 24 hours came, nobody came, and after a day or two, he finally picked himself up and came back, but he did hold off some of the enemy so that the platoon was able to make its uh, retreat. Uh, not too long afterwards, he was wounded, taken prisoner by the Chinese, put in a POW camp. Chinese offered to repatriate him, which he refused. He didn't want to go back to communist Hungary, but he was cited by the POWs there. Those of you who are old enough probably remember that the morale of the younger troops in Korea was very, very low. A lot of them died. He was credited with saving the life of over 23 POWs that he was involved in. With He used the skills he had learned in the concentration camps to go out, steal food and medicine and things of that nature. And he was, uh, somebody said at one point that he spent 24 hours a week picking the lice off one of the wounded veterans that couldn't do it himself. Uh, it was JWV and I guess a friend that laid around his friends from the camp that brought these actions to light because he was never put in or if he was put in, his sergeant somehow or the officers held the, requ the request back. But finally, like I said, in 2005, he received the Medal of Honor. He passed away a few years ago from cancer and there was a medical center in the Midwest that is now named after him. The other one on the left, Private Leonard Kravitz, uh, the uncle of the rock musician, uh, Lenny Kravitz, <laughs> uh, also a machine gunner, uh, who also was asked to hold, volunteer to stay back while his platoon retreated and he held off and diverted a Chinese communist attack, was killed in the process. And when his folks re returned, they found him slumped over the machine gun. Again, it was a friend of his that pushed and pushed and pushed. And finally, he was awarded the Medal of Honor posthumously, and it was given to his niece, 
The Vietnam War also saw two Jews receive the Medal of Honor, Captain Jack Jacobs. Many of you probably have seen him. He's a uh, commentator, I think, on CBS News and on the cable channels. And Airman First Class John Livetto. I'm slightly prejudiced being Air Force myself. I like to talk about John because he was the first airman to receive the Medal of Honor. He was a crew chief on a gunship, a C-147 gunship, circling over a special forces camp in the southern part and northern part of South Vietnam that was being attacked. And the airplane was hit by a mortar, which blew a hole in the side of the fuselage. Uh, he was covered with about 40 shrapnel wounds down his back and legs and everything. The pilots managed to keep the airplane flying. That's the one good thing. But the loadmaster, who was dropping flares, had just armed a flare and was ready to drop it when the mortar hit, and he dropped it on the floor of the airplane. And now we've got this armed flare, one million candle power, rolling back and forth. Uh, Levito basically, as they said, swimming in his own blood, finally managed to grab a hold of the thing and throw it out just as it ignited, saving both the airplane and the crew. And for that, he was awarded the Medal of Honor. For us, interestingly, and I can go back now to what I talked about, Simon Wolf's book about putting in names who necessarily weren't Jewish. A lot of, a lot of Jews back then changed their name or even changed their religion on their papers because in World War II, particularly, because they were afraid of what might happen to them. Uh, this was an opposite case. He was inducted in the, in the Hall of Honor in our uh, uh, museum here in Washington. And as I was told, his family was there and they didn't understand why John was being inducted in this particular <laughs> museum. Uh, and he, she said he wasn't Jewish. And, but we have a glass case, they brought it out. It's now displayed a membership application in which you certify and affirm that I am honorably discharged and I affirm I am of the Jewish faith. This was the first time his family knew that he was Jewish. We have this happening throughout history in this year. Only last year from the war in Afghanistan, one Jewish soldier specialist, Christopher Solis, uh, was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor, making a total of 19 Jewish servicemen who have earned that prestigious award. On a somewhat brighter side, Jewish service personnel have risen to the highest ranks of the military. General Robert Magnus, former Deputy Commandant of the Marine Corps, Lieutenant General Stephen Blum, Chief of the National Guard Bureau, the late Admiral Jeremy Borda, Chief of Naval Operations, and Generals Norton Schwartz and David Goldfein, both former Air Force Chiefs of Staff. They are but a few. From Korea onward, it is not possible to state the exact number of Jews who served and continue to serve in all of the armed services. We can only assume today that the number of Jews in the active duty military is a bit less than the proportion of Jews in the population, or about 15,000. What we do know, however, is that since 9-11, 68 Jewish servicemen and women have died in the defense of the United States. One needs no further proof that the service, dedication, and heroism of Jewish servicemen and women continues to stand out. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is an abbreviated history of 350 plus years of Jewish contributions to the defense of the United States. Thank you. Had a very varied uh, career over a long time. So what was it that particularly drew you to be a docent at the Jewish Museum now in your multiple retirements? Pardon? I'm sorry. After so many retirements, what was it that drew you to, to this particular project? You've had so many careers um, across. Oh, how did I get involved with the museum? Yeah. Uh, actually, one of the members of my uh, post at the time, I was always interested in history to begin with. One of the members of my, my post at the time was the docent. Uh, 
But what he had in enthusiasm, he lacked in factual knowledge of history. <laughs> and uh, I used to go with him. I used to drive him to the meetings and so on and so forth. And uh, what I found out about the museum, of course, I went there and I brought some of my own artifacts over there that are in the museum right now. In fact, uh, they just opened up a brand new Vietnam exhibit uh, not too long ago. And I've got several things, including a beautiful I think it's beautiful portrait of me uh, standing by my fighter and all that good stuff, real tack killer type thing. But I just got interested realizing that tours, unfortunately, not too many people go to the museum because there's no parking there. It's on 18th and R Street, if you can real, realize that. But uh, it, I just got interested in the fact that people would come and there wasn't really anybody there to tell them what they were seeing and what it meant and why. And I just kind of evolved into it. And besides, I like talking. I like public speaking, and I like to talk. And uh, that's it. In fact, I'm look, starting to look for a replacement now. It's coming down to DC every now and then. It's uh, starting to wear a little bit. But uh, it's, 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 I, I love doing it. Thank you very much for your service, sir, and uh, a wonderful presentation. When is the uh, museum going to open? I think I was reading in the paper that it's supposed to be like June 7. Oh, that's the new, um, it's at the Washington Hebrew Museum or Washington Jewish Museum on F Street, I believe. Oh, uh, that's, that is not a military museum. It's about life in Washington, Jewish life in Washington. That's, yeah, that was very interesting. It's, do other nations have similar museums? Like, is there a Jewish museum for military history in England or in France? Do you find yourself talking about Jewish war stories in World War II? Well, Can you elaborate on that. No, in English, the English have a fantastic Imperial War Museum. Uh, there's also a uh, comparable organization called JAX, that is the Jewish basically Jewish war veterans in England. The Israelis have a war museum, if you can imagine that. I mean, that's, uh, Germany has a war museum, but mostly it's, you know, aircraft and stuff like that. It has no political overtones or anything. Uh, I've not seen, I've not seen one in France, but uh, I never spent that much time in France. I have a question. Sure. <laughs> Um, it's about titles, um, never s having served in the military or no family members who have. Um, I, I like to, res I really want to respect uh, those who have served, but like uh, you are a doctor, you are a lieutenant colonel. How would I address you? As lieutenant colonel, I'm, my PhD is, my, like my wife says, you're not a real doctor. Okay. <laughs> so, so I would, I would, okay. it's, it's in history, you know. <laughs> Hi, Hi, thank you, Lieutenant Colonel. Is there a book you could recommend that would, you know, do a little bit more to educate us on the history of Jewish uh, soldiers in American history? Well, there is a brand new book out uh, by Adam Mendelssohn called uh, Jewish Soldiers in the Civil War, the Union Army. Uh, Lord, there's there's all sorts of books. There's an ex troop. Um, which is about a special unit that the British had that were made up of Jewish expatriates. Uh, there's a new one coming, has just come out too by, by, by Churchill of all people. Uh, or it's not written by him, but it's Churchill's Secret Army or something, which is also an ex-troop uh, type book. Um, Lord, I mean, there are so many, really. I guess you just have to... Do you have a favorite? Uh, no, the books that I'm reading, I like the X-Troop book. That was good. And uh, the problem with the uh, uh, soldier, Jewish soldiers in the Civil War is that it's really a work in process. It's based on the work of the Shep Chappelle Manuscript Institute that are doing the research. When the book was published, they only had... 1300 confirmed Jews because they're using modern research methods and everything else like that. And there'll be more. In fact, when I called them, I think there were already a couple hundred more, <laughs> but I, I didn't put that number in uh, the book review that I wrote. But uh, I think if you just Google, you'll, you'll get all sorts of uh, 
stuff. And there's also, there was a movie, and it might be a book called Above and Beyond, which is really about Americans that went to Israel in 1948 and actually formed, helped form the Jewish, the Israeli Air Force, uh, which was technically then against the law. Some of them smuggled parts in and things like that, uh, that because it was an embargo. The U.S. had an embargo at the time. I just want to say thank you for your service, sir. I work for the U.S. Army currently, um, but I have a question. Do you, does the museum do outreach as far as educating? And I guess the question, the other question, part of the question is, um, how many do you get? A lot of people who are surprised that of the Jew, the amount of Jewish soldiers that were a part of the armed forces in history and just and currently. Nobody's ever asked that question, and so uh, I, I could. I, I'm sure that there are people that. that I know, for example, uh, this uh, this one Union soldier back in 1865-66, uh, you know, he, he wrote in a journal called the American Review, uh, said, you know, he was a soldier during his units, he was a recruiter, never saw a Jew in uniform, blah, blah, blah. He says, I talked to a lot of my compatriots, they didn't either. Well, of course, a lot of them didn't even identify themselves. This is one thing the uh, Jewish soldiers in Civil War brings out that there were so few, there was only a couple Civil War regiments that had 20 Jews in them. That was the most in any one regiment. And there was usually just one or two. Uh, an interesting story came out also recently, and it's mentioned in that book about a Passover Seder that was held during the Civil War with 20 Jews from the 73rd, I think it was Pennsylvania Regiment, which itself only had three Jews in it. But the commander was Ruther B. Hayes, who became president later on, but he, and he allowed it and they brought others in. Um, so, uh, no, I don't know that people really looked at it or questioned it or anything. In the museum, we have a couple of uh, Medal of Honor recipients uh, one in particular, whose real name was one thing, he got his medal under another name, and there is a belief that he re-enlisted later on in another service under yet a third name. Wow. So, um, you know, that, so this the, is, pardon? Do the museum do outreach? Do they do, the, like, a, so a, I'm the outreach, I guess. <laughs> 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 no, but one of the things they need to do is do a little bit more exchanging and stuff like that with other museums. I think we have time for one more question. Sure. We didn't hear you talk much about World War II. Uh, you, in other words, you went through World War I and Civil War and Revolution, but World War II, is that because the, the, the Jewish and military were more mainstreamed at that point, by that point? Well, we were also a larger population, much larger population by World War II time. So, yes. so that's why, I mean, I don't, I, I've got figures at home. I don't remember exactly what the population of the Jews in the United States was in World War I time. Right. But in World War II, it was, I think we were getting to that 1%, 2% level. So that's why you have the basic doubling of, of Jews in the uh, military. And again, a lot of them, a lot of Jews in World War I and in World War II were immigrants who wanted to give back to the United States for the freedom that they had gotten by coming to the United States. And Mainly from Europe, I guess. From Europe, yeah, from Eastern Europe. Germans, uh, the Ritchie boys, who you may have heard of, were a bunch of uh, uh, army people trained in, to be spies and interpreters. A lot of them were German-speaking Jews who had left Germany prior to 1938 or right around that 38, 39 time frame. Uh, the ex troop that I mentioned were Jews that had gone to England and were initially treated as, you know, uh, enemy aliens or something like that until they realized what they had. They had these German speaking people who knew the, the traditions, knew everything, you know, and they gathered them. So you have that. Uh, one, one from World War I, a gentleman by the name of Krotoshinsky left Russia to avoid the draft came to the United States and enlisted in the army in World War I and turned out to get the Distinguished Service Cross. He was one of two things that saved the, what the, was then the Lost Battalion uh, in World War I. 
the battalion that got stuck behind German lines. It was a, a carrier pigeon <laughs> that was able to carry a message and him who actually went through the German lines and uh, brought the news where, where the, the, the lost battalion was. The funny thing about it, he says, as he went through the lines and finally heard American voices, he started to think, what can I say to make them think I'm not a German? He had such a heavy accent. <laughs> and so he decided on saying, hello. <laughs> he figured that no German would ever get up and say, hello, hello. <laughs> and that's what he did. And that's who he was recognized. Oh, man. Anyway, thank you all so very, very much. I appreciate your time and questions. Thank you so much for your service and contributions. And because of people like you, we're proudly celebrating in this country Jewish American Heritage Month. And on behalf of the Rotary Club's Trees for the Capital program, I am pleased and proud to present you with this certificate signifying our commitment to plant a tree in your honor in our nation's capital. And the, the certificate does say Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Sheldon A. Goldberg. Okay. <laughs> So Thank that, you so much. That is really, really nice.